you know, I've never quite understood the whole climate change thing. I'm a historian, so I don't really speak the language of science. I look at things and I go, what does this mean? So I look for something that looks comfortable to me, and I went for some data. And I found a timeline, and there's nothing that makes a historian feel more comfortable than a timeline. It's ordered, it's neat, everything goes year to year to year to year. It's wonderful. And this timeline's attached to a graph, of course. Now, I remember a little bit of math and science from high school. Let's throw a title up here first. North American Carbon Dioxide Output by Fuel Type. And then I know on this axis I'm supposed to put some numbers and, uh, and label it, too. Millions of tons of carbon dioxide gas. Millions of tons. That sounds so weird. But I'm going to try to put some understanding on it. Some human elements. Now i got to draw in my data. First a line here, and this is solid fuel. And that's originally wood, and then it eventually becomes things like coal. And all the things that we burn, fossil fuels, that are solid. Next up, I'm going to put in a line here. This is liquid fuel. That's going to be oil and eventually gasoline. And then the third line here, this is gaseous fuel. And gaseous fuel is, well, natural gas and town gas and all those different gases. The three basic states of matter. We've got solid, liquid, and gas. I remember that from high school science. But it's still just data. It doesn't make really any sense to me. I've got to figure out what it actually means, which means I've as a historian, got to start putting dates and times and things on this timeline. So, okay, I'm going to start first here. Let me choose railroads. Railroads are cool, big steam engines, awesome. Between 1860 and 1880, railroad mileage in the United States tripled. That's amazing to think about. During the Civil War and afterwards, we're building railroads all over the place. And then between 1880 and 1920, Railroad mileage triples again. We've got railroads crisscrossing every corner of the nation. It's amazing. And look at that spike, that spike in solid fuels, the carbon dioxide made by solid fuels. That's all that coal burning in those steam engines. And then eventually there's going to be another spike as liquid fuels get used in oil burning engines. Okay, in the Park Service, we could talk about this in all sorts of different places. First, my mind leaps to the traditional ones. The places where we got steam engines. Steamtown in Pennsylvania, Golden Spike out west, the Transcontinental Railroad, and the industry story. Those are kind of the, the no-brainers, though. I'm thinking bigger. I'm thinking that even all of those big western parks that had railroads built through them, and almost every one of them did, and those railroads sometimes were used as hunting lines. You literally could point to a bison and say, hey, you want to talk about carbon? You want to talk about why we have so few of those? Let's blame some steam engines. Let's talk about some history. All right, let me grab a fresh graph here. Now, you can't talk about carbon without talking about Tom Edison. I know that's kind of weird, isn't it? He's the dude that invented the light bulb or said he invented the light bulb. But he built the first coal power plant, and it was called Pearl Street Station. And that was in the early 1880s in New York City. And from then on, everything was about electric and how we made electric power. There's this battle called the War of the Currents. Not an actual war. It was more like a war of words about whether AC or DC was better. And then people started getting electricity after Westinghouse won that war. By 1917, 25% of all American homes had electric power. By 1929, 70% of U.S. homes were electrified. Now look at the carbon. Look at the carbon coming from coal, from those solid fuels, as it starts climbing. That solid fuel's powering those generators, keeping people's homes lit. And then oil starts getting burned for those lights, too. And then eventually natural gas. And we start using tons and tons and tons of this fuel to power our light bulbs. And that has an impact on the environment. Now, the obvious place to talk about this is, well, at Tom Edison's lab in New Jersey. But I think there's other places we could do it, too. Maybe in Buffalo, you know, where they had that Pan American Exposition. We have a park there, too, called Teddy Roosevelt Inaugural. But Teddy Roosevelt was inaugurated because the president was assassinated at the Pan American Exposition, where the Tower of Light was and the Temple of Music, all of it, the gleaming, shining city, all powered by electricity. Or maybe we could go out west, along the Presidio at Golden Gate, 
That's where the West Coast Shining Electric City was, at the Panama Pacific Expo. Literally across the nation, we can talk about the impact on our environment of our love of electricity in the past and how it's gotten us where we are today. You know, I'm starting to understand how climate change happened and where it came from and how humans were involved. But how were we? How was the National Park Service part of this story, too? Let's grab another grab and keep the detective work going. Okay, so in the 1890s, the Duryea Motor Wagon Company made the first commercial car. That's that old-timey horseless carriage. But it took until October 1908 for Henry Ford to come along and make it affordable. You know, the assembly line thing. After just 19 years, though, Americans were addicted. The 15 millionth Model T rolled off that assembly line. Okay, even for a history geek, I'm really starting to love this science stuff, and this graph in particular. Look how the liquid carbon footprint was starting to skyrocket, and then wham! The Great Depression. People were suffering, but maybe the Great Depression was kind of a boon for the Earth, for Mother Nature, keeping our carbon footprint down because our economy sucked. So what does this have to do with the Park Service? Where can we talk about this? Anywhere. We've made the attraction, the car, like that drive through Wawona tree. Cars are how we've told people to, to visit our places. Colonial Parkway in Virginia is a park built explicitly to drive from 1607 to 1781, all in the comfort of your beautiful sedan blasting the AC. And Civil War battlefields have been havens of the auto tour for almost their entire history. But it's not just cultural parks that can talk about the cultural dimension. Even places like Grand Teton have gotten in on the act. Think of all the aviation fuel that gets burned in the National Park Service's only in-park airport. It's been in operation since the 1930s. I thought this was a great big mystery when I started. How's history connected to climate change? But you know what? I don't think it's a mystery at all. It's not mystery. It's just history. Humes have dug this climate change hole for generations, and historians, with a little imagination, can help us see how.